Hi everyone, my name is Tichelle and welcome back to The Journey. As you can see, today we're going to be talking about cerebrovascular accident, also known as CVA, which is also known as stroke. Okay, so, so far we're going to start off with how the body works, right? Again, when you see how the body works, you see where the disease or the malfunction is taking place, and that way you can see how it disrupts the natural process. Alright, so here I drew a person, right, and we have arteries and we have veins. The veins um, carries the um, deoxygenated blood, which is why I put in blue, and the arteries carry oxygenated, oxygenated blood, which I put in red. Okay, so as you can see here, we have the functioning of the heart, right, and it's doing the whole circulation system, right, and we have the arteries that supply uh, nutrients to the brain, going to the brain as well, and then you also have little veins to um, take the excretions from the blood. Now, there's three main things that I just want to talk about, and those are these three arteries that are connected to the aorta. I don't know if you guys remember in anatomy, you had three arteries at the very top of the aorta, right? You have the brachiocephalic, you have the left common, part, left common carotid artery, and then you have the left subclavian artery, okay? And they all bring supplies to the brain, right? And then eventually it splits out so it gets tiny and tiny and tiny and um, smaller to the point where you have these different uh, arteries which you have within the circle of Willis, okay, which all supply uh, nutrients to the brain. Now, this is how the normal function of the body works, right? Oxygen brings back with all the nutrients to provide uh, nutrients to the cell. The veins take all of the waste products from the cell, right, and the CO2 and eventually uh, filters it through um, the heart and the lungs, okay? Now, a stroke, which I drew another picture here, okay, um, is pretty much occurs when the blood supply to part of your brain is interrupted or severely reduced, depriving the brain tissue of oxygen and nutrients within minutes, um, and eventually brain cells will um, begin to die. All right, so this is pretty much a zoom picture of this over here, right? And I have my nice arteries that are supplying blood supply. And you see this black dot here, right? This is my interruption, my interruption of blood flow. And because I have an interruption of blood flow, right? The blood can no longer feed this vessel that are, feel it, that are feeding these neurons, right? So then this area becomes darkened right and this area begins to die because there is no circulation right and then eventually right if this part begins to die this is going to be a build up here right or can be a build up because this area is no longer pathway this area begins to die off okay which causes the ischemic or the ischemia to occur right and eventually this is going to lead to necrosis all right so I put on this side, just a fun fact to know, but if you're longer than 10 minutes without oxygen, you're, um, what you have is a cerebral infarct, which is what I was showing you here, right? This area starts to die off with irreversible change. So again, when it comes to stroke, the biggest thing is time. You want to act fast, okay? That's the biggest, biggest thing. Um, they also consider it a brain attack. Okay, so a stroke is also known as a brain attack. So if you hear the word stroke, also think in your mind brain attack. And the reason why they changed the name is because they want the doctors and nurses and all the healthcare professionals to act quickly on the matter. So when sometimes when you hear brain attack, you're more alert of wanting to help or see what's going on rather than hearing the word stroke. Okay, so if you hear any other word uh, as far as brain attack, this is what they're talking about. All right, and another thing too. The ischemia doesn't always have to be in this region. It depends on where the, the clotting or the blockage occur. So the blockage can occur here, right, and starts um, the deading of the supply at this area, right? It can start here, anywhere along um, the vessels and the arteries, okay? But mainly because we're talking about a stroke, it's going to happen somewhere in here where it affects the brain, okay? So as long as you know that the interruption is occurring somewhere in this region, right, that's eventually ultimately going to affect the brain, all right, you're going to want to act quickly. Right. Okay. 
So now we're going to get into what causes a stroke, right? So we know what a stroke is, so now we want to know what causes the stroke. So there's three different things that can cause a stroke. You have a thrombosis, you have an embolism, and you have a hemorrhage, right? So a thrombosis is pretty much a clotting of the blood, right, in any part of the circulation system, right, that blocks off blood flow, okay? Now, the thrombosis can occur anywhere. It can happen in the legs, right, which is called a DVT, deep venous thrombosis, right? It can happen in the femoral artery, wherever in the body, okay? But of course, since we're talking about stroke, we're talking about something that's going to be pertaining closer to that area of the brain where eventually there are going to be neurological deficits. Okay, so the next thing we have is embolism, and sometimes embolism can sound very, very similar to a thrombosis, sometimes to the form where you even mix them up. Now, the only difference between an embolism and a thrombosis, right, because an embolism is also a blockage, right, which is pretty much an obstruction here, obstruction and blockage, same thing, right, causing material, though, so it's not just blood. Thrombosis is strictly blood. Embolism can, can, can be blood, but it can also be air bubble, it can be a, a fat globule, and those are people who have like um, high, high cholesterol levels, right, and they have a buildup of a lot of plaque in those areas, they'll have the a flat fat globule, and pretty much in that area, the fat will pretty much be blocking off the circulation, okay, and then you also have a foreign material. Now, foreign material can be uh, stentings, right, if you had a cardiac problem before and you had stentings, and, and you had stent put in, Right, that stent could then eventually get blocked up or sometimes maybe get dislodged or different things like that can happen. So it's just a foreign material or any material that can cause blockage. Okay? Okay, a hemorrhage is very different from this one from the rest of them because there's a rupture of the vessels, okay, which eventually cause bleeding into the brain. So I have my three pictures here to demonstrate exactly what is going on. So the first one I'm going to use is the thrombosis, right? And a thrombosis is pretty much, with the black one, a thrombosis is pretty much this, okay? Right, blood flow is traveling, traveling, and let's just say the patient did have a DVT, right? And the DVT eventually dislodges from the calf area, work its way up, right? It was able to pass through the heart, but then, these three vessels that supplying, right, that, that clot came through, and then those tiny, tinier vessels that are not able to get that clot through, it, it sits there. And then this whole region, or wherever the blockage is happening, starts dying, okay? And that's your, um, your stroke, right, and a thrombus. An embolism, let's just say, right, this patient has very high cholesterol, was eating well, right? Or just a history, family history of it, right? So they're more prone to having high cholesterol. Same thing happens, right? This time, right, plaque buildup, let's say most of the time it happens within the carotid, which is why when you do your cardiac assessment, right, you're checking for bruits in those areas to see um, that whistling sound. Do you hear that whistling sound? Because it should be flowing through. So anytime you hear that whistling sound, it can be either narrowing of the carotid artery or the fact that uh, plaque buildup is in that area. Okay, so let's just say this patient, right, there was a whole bunch of plaque in this area to the point where it blocks off the circulation. So there's no more circulation, at least on this part, to supply the brain, right? And then this area starts dying. Right? This area starts dying. And it wasn't because of a clot, but it was because of a plaque, right? Or a fat goblet. So then here, we're going to talk about a hemorrhage now. So remember, these vessels are very, very, very tiny. Very tiny. All right? Very tiny. And any amount of pressure that is uncontrolled over a period of time, right? If you have high blood pressure or so, and there's a constant pressure, 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 beating on those vessels because these vessels are thin and they're very delicate and very fragile. So these, this pressure, right, this turbulence flow of pressure of blood is just rushing through, rushing through, rushing through. So finally, one of the vessels says, I can't take it anymore, right? And it finally ruptures, it pops. And all the blood that was in there, right, and that was in these vessels start leaking out and leaking, and leaking, and leaking, 
and leaking and leaking, right? I have one or two things that are happening here. I am experiencing, I see CP, which is pretty much increased intracranial pressure, right? Because of all the blood that is sitting in that area, I'm at risk for that, okay? And eventually, because the blood is now leaking, it's not going to the area that it was supposed to go to. So then these areas start dying because all the blood is leaking into the uh, brain tissues rather than in the actual vessels, okay? So there's a leakage. Eventually, that blood supply gets cut off. The rest of the, um, right? For perfusion of blood to the brain, okay, and that's why that area is dying off because the body is not able to perfuse that area, right, because it's leaking into the vessels, so it's leaking into the tissues and not the vessels, so the vessels can't take it to where it needs to go because it's no longer in the vessels, it's in the tissue, so all right? And if you guys want to know more information about increased intracranial pressure, please check out my other video um, that I dedicated specifically just for increased intracranial pressure if you want more information on that topic, okay? So these are my three different ways of how a stroke can be caused, okay? Thrombosis, embolism, and a hemorrhage, all right? Here we have non-modifiable risk factors, and we have modifiable risk factors. So the difference between modifiable and non-modifiable are these are the things that we can't change and these are the things that we can change. Okay, those are the difference between this one and this one. So the things that we can't change is your age, right? We can't change our age as much as we want to, we can't change it. And pretty much you're more at a higher risk of having a stroke, right, if you are 55 years and older. Now, you also have a more risk of having a stroke if you are a male, right? More males tend to have strokes than females for some reason, all right? And then, last but not least, if you're African American, okay, which is also known as the symbol AA. So a lot of times, just throughout um, the course of seeing different diseases and different processes and things like that, um, almost nine out of ten times, it's because of being African American. You had a higher risk. I don't know if you're at a higher risk because of uh, nutritional values and as far as um, you know, not not being able to have access to health care. Because there's many factors that can play a part that eventually um, you see in more um, African Americans, you see these conditions rather than um, it just being totally genetic. Okay. Um, I know genetically wise, African Americans do have a higher blood pressure, but as far as why they occur more, those possible other factors that can play a part may probably be the reason why you see more African Americans are uh, exhibiting having a stroke. Okay, uh, and then you have the modifiable risk factors, and the modifiable risk factors are the things that you can change or at least try to manage or control, right? So I have diabetes. I have my obesity, oral contraceptive, which is a medication, okay, and this is, this is pretty much birth control. And as you guys know, one of the side effects of, of um, taking birth control is having a lot of clots. And again, remember, an ischemic uh, stroke, right, are, are, your, are your clottings, right, have, of having multiple clots. So you have uh, smoking is another reason why, because it constricts the vessels. Right, and if I have tighter, tighter vessels, right, um, I have a, a tendency to have a higher blood pressure. And then you have alcohol and drugs. Your drug is uh, amphetamine, okay, that for some reason causes strokes. And then you have your another medication. You have anticoagulation therapy, right, and those are your Coumadin, right, your Sorelto, your heparin, right, any of those that are going to cause your blood to thin out. And why? Because when you have your hemorrhagic stroke, what's going to happen? It's going to bleed and bleed and bleed because you, your blood is already thin, okay? And then you have your cholesterol management, right? So those, those patients who have high cholesterol, right, and you have a higher um, risk of building up of clot, eventually those are going to cause a blockage, right? And they can have a blockage anywhere in this area, right, that are going to cause neurological defects. Then you also have 
high blood pressure, which we talked about before, because you have a, a turbulent, a high flow, right? And eventually that can cause the rupture. Having an increased hematocrit, because eventually what's going to happen, that blood is going to clot, right? And then periodontal disease. This is like, I know, a left, left wing, but periodontal disease has um, increased association with strokes. So if you have, uh, you know, gum diseases or things like that, just make sure that you are taking up with your dental care. And these are things that can be prevented because if you go for your, your biannual, you know, um, teeth cleanings, you know, that can definitely help prevent a lot of bacterial infections and things like that that happens in the mouth area. Okay, so periodontal is one. And then you have your atherosclerosis, all right, which we talked about, about already with the, with the arteries, right? And then cardiac disease. And in particular, I put in parentheses atrial fibrillation, also known as AFib. Why? Because the fact that the heart is pumping so fast is not pumping effectively. So um, the blood that's supposed to go from the different chambers, right, it stays and occupies in, into one chamber or several different chambers, right, and that blood sits there and it clots. And when it clots, right, eventually, when the blood does eventually go down and start to circulate, right, those clots are being shot out, you know, in different directions, different areas, and if it so happens to hit the, the brain, right, there goes your stroke. So these are your um, different causes of stroke, right, or risk factors of stroke that can happen. So it doesn't just necessarily mean that um, you just form a clot. These can be the, the manipulators of why you're forming the clot or why you're having the bleed or why you're having uh, the plaque right. border. So now we know the causes, the different causes, right, and the different um, risk factors. The next thing is the types of strokes because, of course, if, there, if there's different causes of stroke, there are going to be different types of strokes, right? Another thing that we all have to learn. <laughs> so we have three different types. You have TIA, which is also known as transchemic, transient ischemic attack, okay? Then you have ischemic stroke, and then you have hemorrhagic stroke. So as you can see, the name the, of what's going on is in the name of the actual stroke. So as you can see, TIA, right? TIA is an ischemic stroke, which is cutting off blood supply, right? Your ischemic stroke is again cutting off blood supply, and then your hemorrhagic stroke is causing a bleed, a hemorrhage. All right. Okay. So the first stroke that I want to go into depth in is pretty much TIA, and as you can see in TIA, right, you can think of T for temporary. All right. So most of the time, when a patient has a TIA, it is a warning sign of impending stroke. So take this as your warning, right? This is like your yellow, your yellow light, okay, before you get to the actual red light. So this is your warning, and it is a temporary neurological deficit resulting from a temporary, right, impairment of blood flow. It lasts less than one hour, all right? And for the most part, on um, the scanning testing, whether it's a CT scan or so, right, there's most of the time there's no evidence of an ischemia. So it doesn't even show up on the, on the actual testing. So, but they will come in with signs and symptoms of neurological deficit, which is why you kind of still treat it as a stroke, but just know that this is your warning sign for impending stroke. All right, so the next stroke we have is the ischemic stroke. And as we said before, an ischemic stroke is pretty much anything that causes um, an obstruction, whether it's from a thrombus, which is a blood clot, or an embolism, which is pretty much plaque, or any other foreign uh, blockage that's going to cut off circulation to the brain. Okay, so with an ischemic stroke, there's five different types, okay? You have a large artery thrombotic stroke, which is pretty much an occlusion of the um, atherosclerotic area. You have small penetrating, which affects one or more of the vessels. They also call it the Leukerner stroke, and the reason why they call it that because of the cavity that it creates once that area has been um, blocked off or obstructed. The damage that it causes, it creates a cavity. Okay, uh, cardiogenic, embolotic, that one is very simple. Cardiac, so you know this is going to be caused by either cardiac issue or cardiac dysrhythmia, right? And you have atrial fibrillation as an example of that. All right, the next one you have is cryptogenic, which um, they're not really sure exactly what causes those type of strokes, okay? So it's in those categories. And then you have other, which other can be either drug use, um, a migraine can cause it, or coagulation um, 
factors, okay? So these are your different types of uh, ischemic stroke. Now, I wouldn't really uh, pay too much attention to the different types of the strokes, but I just want to make sure that I at least mention it so you guys are aware that there are five different types of ischemic stroke, but they kind of go under the same umbrella. Most questions don't really, you know, specify, oh, is this a, is this a large artery or is this a small penetrating? They just want to know, is, do you know the difference between an ischemic stroke and a hemorrhagic stroke and the different signs and symptoms or um, nurse intervention that you're going to do for each one of those things, okay? So I would just kind of just remember the umbrella of what an ischemic stroke is, is that it is an obstruction of complete blockage, right? Whether it's a clot, plaque, but it's in, a, it's in an obstruction, okay? Now, what's happening on a patho level, right? For those of you guys who need to understand why is the cells dying, right? So the cells end up switching to anaerobic respiration. Now remember, the body uses aerobic, meaning with oxygen, which is why the body needs oxygen. Really, really, really needs oxygen, right? So the cell switches to anaerobic. Ana means against, so it is or without. So they switch to an anaerobic state of, of respirations, right? And when they do this, it causes a buildup of lactic acid. And when that lactic acid is built up, it changes the pH level within the body, which brings it down, making the body more acidotic, which eventually leads to inadequate amount to ATP, because remember, the cell still needs to thrive and do what it needs to do, and it needs energy, right? So because the, the acidic level, it changed the adequate amount of ATP, right? So we already have a, a, a lack of ATP, right? Which eventually, some of the cells are not going to um, be able to get ATP, or there's going to be a depletion of whatever is remaining, right? And from there, the body is unable to maintain a metabolic balance, and eventually the cell dies, okay? And this happens very, very quick, very, very fast, right? So this is exactly what's going on and why the cell is dying. Okay. okay. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the penumbra region, region, and pretty much what that is, it's an area within the brain, right, that is still um, salvageable, even though um, within the middle of it, it's the infarct area, the dying area. It's a, another area around the dying area that is, is dying but not yet died. So you still have a chance to save that within appropriate time, okay? So if that makes any sense whatsoever, right? It's dying, but not yet dying, okay? And that is your penumbra region. So it's in the area of the brain where the infarct is. Around that area is the penumbra, right? And if you are able to at least treat it within an appropriate time, you can save that area before it dies, okay? Now, here's a fun fact, right? 1.9 million neurons die each minute that the stroke is not treated, all right? So that is a lot, a lot, a lot of neurons, okay? And then you have an ischemic brain ages 3.6 years each hour um, without treating the stroke. So you may say, okay, what is that one? Okay, pretty much an ischemic brain is pretty much a dying brain, right, that area. And you are, we already know as we get older, right, our body's not going to function the same. There are going to be things that eventually going to deteriorate, and our brain is one of those things, okay? And just with an ischemic brain, within an hour of you not treating that ischemic brain, it ages 3.6 years. That's three, almost three, or more than three and a half years worth in just one hour that you've lost on your brain, okay? So instead of being a 28-year-old, right, you are now a 31-year-old at least a 31-year-old brain, okay? So these are fun facts to know. And within the penumbra region, I just wanted to mention, because they're trying to save that area, the doctors will kind of request that the blood pressure be high, okay? Not too, too high, because again, you don't want to have a rupture, but the doctor will request to have an, a higher blood pressure than normal. So instead of a blood pressure that is 120 over 80, they may ask to have a blood pressure 150 over over 100 or so, or 150 over 80, or you know, um, only because with that blood pressure being that high, that area that it has the potential of dying, right, 
if with the pressure being high, the blood is able to get to that area to then um, give it the nutrients and pretty much um, care that it needs in that area. Okay, so the doctors would request for the blood pressure to be a little bit higher than normal, just so that way that area can be fed and be able to be saved within the appropriate time. All right, so now we have hemorrhagic stroke, and pretty much hemorrhagic stroke, like we said before, is caused by bleeding into the brain tissue, the ventricles, and the subarachnoid spaces, okay? So if you hear this more than once, by now you should kind of understand ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, and at least TIA. All right, so now these are different types of hemorrhagic stroke that we have. You can have intracranial hemorrhage, you can have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you can have an intracerebral hemorrhage. And pretty much, they're all the same, it's just the region of where the bleeding is taking place. So of course, the subarachnoid hemorrhage is happening in the subarachnoid area. The intracerebral is happening more in the inner part of the cerebrum, right? And then uh, you have arterial venous malformation, which is also known as AVM. And AVM is pretty much a condition that's caused um, in a, um, around the embryo stage and, um, that occurs in, fe in, in fetal development or so, but you won't see the evidence of it until later on, okay? So pretty much what it is, is it's an entanglement, right, of your vessels, and whether they're arteries and veins, they're an entanglement, which eventually, um, they eventually lack a capillary bed, okay? So it's pretty much almost like a knot. Just think of your vessels just all tying up a knot within each other, right? And this is pretty much your hemorrhagic stroke that happened in the younger um, population or so, that they don't really have any cardiac issues, they don't have, you know, um, high blood pressure or anything like that, but then all of a sudden they have a hemorrhagic bleed. It could be from this reason here, and this is something that happens in the embryo stages of life, that eventually manifests itself later on, if it does, in the form of a hemorrhagic stroke where you see the entanglement of vessels, okay, which they eventually lack a capillary bed. All right, now you have a normal brain metabolism that is, that is disrupted by the brain exposure to the blood, right, that is eventually going to increase the intracranial pressure, which then compresses or causes injury to the brain, which is going to reduce perfusion pressure, and it also can eventually cause basal spasms, okay? So this is the pathology part of the hemorrhagic stroke, okay? It's a, it's a little bit different from the ischemic stroke, but ultimately result in the same thing, cell death, okay? Because of the crushing, um, basal spasms, right? Injury towards the brain, and again, a disruption of blood supply. Okay, that's the biggest thing, disruption of blood supply. And then also things that can cause the hemorrhagic stroke, you have intracranial neoplasm, right? That's, that's another thing that can cause. And um, just multiple, multiple things as far as drugs, you have amphetamine can cause um, disruption with that as well. Sometimes alcohol use, right? Because alcohol deals with the liver. Liver helps with the coagulation properties and things like that something was to go wrong, you're more prone, prone to bleeding, it's bleeding in the brain. So there's multiple factors that can also play a part with hemorrhagic stroke, but these are like the main ones that you would see for your testing and within neuro, as far as you know, neurological components that hemorrhaging are happening within the brain. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the clinical manifestations, also known as sign and symptoms, also known as my nursing assessment, right? These are the things that I'm going to assess as a nurse because this is what the, the patient is going to be presenting with, okay? So first things up, we have numbness and weakness of the face, the arm, the leg, and it's mainly going to be on one side, okay? So you're going to see facial drooping and mainly going to be on one side, okay? Um, uh, again, you have confusion or change in mental status. You have trouble speaking or understanding speech, okay? Visual disturbances, you're gonna have difficulty walking, dizziness, or loss in balance of coordination. And then you have a sudden severe headache. You'll hear the patient complain of say, I have the worst headache in my life. The minute you hear that, I have the worst headache of my life, you wanna be proactive and kinda of start, you know, seeing if um, CTs or, you know, diagnostic tests can be done as soon as possible so that way you can kinda of get an idea of what's going on, okay? So, 
this is a hint, hint, worst headache of my life. And I say that again because sometimes you think the question is going to be given to you clearly. Oh, the patient, you know, um, you know, what are what are some symptoms, signs and symptoms of having a hemorrhagic stroke, right? A, B, C, D, and it has all the choices. Sometimes you may hear a fabricated story where you hear the patient was at home and, you know, was cooking dinner and sitting down and all of a sudden complained to the husband that she had the worst headache of her life and the husband, you know, is, is, trying, to is trying to understand what to do. He brings her to the hospital. Whatever, whatever story, right? And you totally missed the fact that she said, I have the worst headache of my life, right? And you missed the question where it says, screen for possible you know, stroke or whatever the case may be, because you're not thinking about it. You just, oh, I'm hearing, okay, worst headache of her life, but you're not really putting together, hey, this is your signs, this is your symptoms, because you get headaches for everything, or just about anything you can get a headache for, but when it comes to stroke, you want to take that very, very seriously, okay? You also have vomiting, early sudden changes in lock, okay? and possible focal seizures due to brain stem involvement. And as you can see, I kind of put an arrow for these last uh, two here because this is what you're mainly going to see in your hemorrhagic stroke. Okay, so where it has this confusion or change in mental status, yes, it can happen for uh, the ischemic stroke, but again, as you see here, an early sudden change, all right? Those sudden changes are going to be your key factors of trying to figure out, hey, what's going on with this patient, okay? Sudden change in level of consciousness, okay? And your seizures, all right? And your and your your headaches, okay, are your key component factors to know that hey, this is a hemorrhagic stroke, okay? All the others is gonna you're gonna see in a combination with hemorrhagic stroke as well as ischemic stroke. So that's why I put them together. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds of knowing exactly. If it's for one, it's mainly going to be for the other. So your signs and symptoms for ischemic is going to be your signs and symptoms in hemorrhagic. The only difference is how the stroke occurred. One was a bleed, one was an obstruction, okay? And then these two points here is what you're mainly going to see in your hemorrhagic stroke, okay? They're going to complain of the headache, the headache, the headache. All right, all right. So now, after I just showed you the signs and symptoms, I'm going to go into each category more in depth because there's some important terms that you guys need to know, right? So the first stuff we have is motor loss. And in parentheses here, um, I put the causes of why you have the motor loss. So it's pretty much a motor neuron lesion, okay? So the terms that I want you guys to know, right? You have hemiplegia, okay? Hemiparesis, okay? So hemiplegia is pretty much paralysis on one side of the body. Okay, cutting down this way mid-sagrally, okay? Hemiplegia is what you're going to experience or see in a patient who has a stroke, all right? Then you have hemiparesis, which is pretty much weakness of one side of the body. And then you have early stages features, maybe uh, flaccid at first, right? But then give or take, uh, when you first have the stroke, right, you, you're, you're gonna be flaccid. There won't be a tone or anything like that or any reflexes, any deep, t um, deep tendon reflexes, okay? It will kind of be absent or barely anything there, all right? But you want to give it at least 48 hours because sometimes they do reappear at those times. And I remember being in the ICU, we had patients who had weakness on one side, and after being there for two nights, and, you know, I tell the patient to, you know, um, follow commands as far as, you know, lift up your hands, lift up your feet, grab my hands, you know, um, squeeze, squeeze my fingers and things like that you realize that all of a sudden they have those strength and those abilities, right? And then you have to go back and change, okay? They're not flaccid. They actually do respond, okay? So sometimes you just want to make sure that you give at least a good 48 hours so that way you can kind of have a more accurate assessment if they are truly flaccid. After the 48 hours, they will still be flaccid, okay? The next up you have is communication loss, all right? And this is happening in Broca's areas and Renicki's area, okay? Um, so you have some terms here that I want you guys to get familiar with because you just may see it on your test or at least when the doctors are talking they're saying that the patient has you know these different things you know what they mean okay so you have dysarthria which is pretty much difficulty speaking you have dysphagia which is impaired speech and then you have aphasia which is loss of speech okay so those are your different things aphasia means to speak a is against, meaning no speaking. 
this means difficulty, so difficulty in speech, in speech, okay? And then here, with aphasia, you have three different types of aphasia. You have expressive aphasia, receptive aphasia, and global aphasia. And of course, I always say global is the worst, just because of the combination of both. So this is not the best of both worlds here. This is the best of worst worlds here. So you have expressive aphasia, which is pretty much your comprehension is intact, completely intact for the most part, okay, in most patients who have expressive aphasia. The problem is not there. The problem is they're not able to say or speak or express themselves correctly, hence the word expressive aphasia, okay? So they're non-fluent, right, whether it's spoken or written. Sometimes you have it down, trying to write it for them, and um, when I write it, but have the board for them, and they'll try to write, and they nothing will come out. And it's so frustrating because they know what they want to say, right? But they can't express themselves, okay? Expressive aphasia, all right? So there is effortful, effortful speech. They're trying, they're trying, they're trying, but they're just not saying anything, okay? Or it's, it's, not, it's not fluent enough where you can understand what they're saying, okay? So that's expressive, but they're completely with it in their mind. They know what you're saying. They can follow commands. They can do what you ask of them but they're just not able to express themselves, okay? The next one you have is receptive aphasia, which is also known as Wernicke's aphasia, okay? So hence the word, this is happening in the Wernicke's area, part of the um, body, and they are unable to understand language, right? They take it literally. So this is the complete opposite of that one where they understand this one, they don't really understand. They take language literally. So an example of that is when you say, hey, man, it's raining cats and dogs outside, you know, which pretty much means that it's raining really hard. But they would take you that literally there are cats and dogs falling from the sky, okay? Um, so they take language literally, okay? They can probably be fluent in their language or so, but they're just not able to receive the information, okay? So now this is a receiving problem, hence the word receptive aphasia. So I'm saying this so that yeah, way you can kind of, if you guys don't always remember, sometimes when you see the word, you can kind of get the definition in the word, okay? Receptive aphasia, all right, they have a hard time receiving because they don't understand, okay? Expressive, they do understand, it's just hard for them to express, okay? And then global is a mix of both. You have times where you you may not be able to express yourself, so that's, that's one thing. You don't know how to express yourself, right? You're trying to, but you can't do it. And then another thing is that you probably don't even understand, which is why I say it's the worst of um, of, of worlds because um, there's a there's a comprehension problem as, as well as not able to express yourself, okay? And they can happen in different time frames where maybe they do understand but they're not able to express. And then the next moment they don't understand, but they're able to express. So it, it, it kind of goes back and forth, or it can be the fact that you have the worst of the two, okay? So this is your communication loss. So now we're on perceptual, perceptual disturbances, okay? And perceptual disturbances, this is where the disturbances is happening between the pathway of the eye and the visual cortex is where you're gonna have the perceptual disturbances problem occurring, all right? So you have a term called homogamous heminopsia, okay? And pretty much what this means is half, is lost of half of the visual field, um, and it may be temporary or it can be permanent. So this is almost as if it was to cover your whole entire eye, right? And you just lost half of your peripheral field, okay? So just put your head over your eye, and that is what a person who has a stroke who has this complication is going to experience. It's pretty much covering half of your eye and their whole um, half of their um, visual field is completely gone, okay? Then you have the affected side of the vision corresponds to the paralyzed side of the body, okay? So this is just something um, just to know when it comes to the eye, the affected side of your vision corresponds to the paralyzed side of your body. Okay, so the side that's paralyzed, that's the side that the vision is going to take place and, and, um, and occur as far as the defects, okay? Also, you have visual, spatial reflect relations, and pretty much what that means is perceiving the relationship of two or more objects in spatial areas. So pretty much what this means is that you have problems um, 
like differentiated the space between one object to the next object, okay? And an example of that is almost like stepping down on the sidewalk. And you know when you're walking on the sidewalk and they have areas where you sl it slopes down and then there's other parts where it has a higher curb on the end and you kind of step down from there? Well, a person who has a, a visual spatial relation, right, a disturbance in that, they just think that the sidewalk goes straight across, okay? So when you're coming off from the sidewalk and you're coming down to the road, right, you'll normally take a step down. With those people, they kind of just think of that it's one whole thing and they just pretty much step or fall, okay? So that's what it means when it says that you're, perceived, you're not able to perceive the relationship between one space to the next, okay? Or an object or something like that. Another example, too, is, um, a B versus a D, okay? You tell the patient to draw a B, and instead they may draw a T, okay? And you'll see this mostly in children um, when they're at a younger age because, the, you know, their body's still developing, so they don't have every part of the neural, neural intact. So you will see different um, things that they're not able to do. So one of the things here is that they're unable to get a visual perception, I mean, position. So they don't know that this is where the position is. So then they put it on the other side, okay? So as long as you remember, it's a positional thing, okay? They're not able to know the differentiate the position and space, all right? Next we have sensor, sensory loss, okay? And this is happening as far as an impairment of touch, all right? So you have a loss of proprioception, which is the ability to perceive the position and motion of the body parts. Okay, so you have a loss of that. So you're not able to perceive or, or know different body parts, right? And you'll have some people, like, you'll have them lift their arms or lift that or whatever. And sometimes it's not the fact that they can't lift it because, you know, when they're doing other things, they're lifting it, right? But sometimes they're not able to differentiate different body parts, like lift up your right hand and they lift up the left hand or something like that, okay? So, again, as the ability to perceive the position and motion of the body parts, okay? And they have a loss of perceiving those things, all right? <clears throat> also, here you have, um, it can involve the visual, tactile, and auditory stimuli disturbances, okay? So it's not just only visual, but it can be for touch, right? Someone touches you and you're perceiving it um, the wrong way because you're not able to um, perceive it the correct way, okay? And auditory stimuli as well. Then you have agnosia, all right? And agnosia is pretty much unable to recognize previously familiar objects by one or more senses. All right, so this is things that you used to be able to do that all of a sudden now you're not able to recognize, okay? And again, this is all frustrating for the patient, probably frustrating for you, but more so on their part just because, you know, think about waking up one day and the things that you're used to doing, the things that you were able to do, you're no longer able to do it. And in your mind, you know what you want to do. You may not be able to express yourself because you have to express aphasia, or you have the sensory loss, so you're not able to, to you know, when someone is touching you or tactile, you're not able to say that it's my left arm or my right arm, right? Which is going to be very frustrating for a patient. So take that into consideration as you're dealing with a patient with strokes because they like to ask a lot of questions as far as how should the nurse talk to this patient, how should the nurse handle this patient, how should the nurse, you know, um, attitude be towards this patient, okay, and it's, again, it's all supporting, 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 positive feedback, positive feedback, okay, for these type of patients because they're going to need the encouragement after, you know, being frustrated and, you know, wanting to give up on themselves because they're not able to do the things that they used to do. So now we have cognitive impairment slash psychological effects, okay, which is pretty much um, damage to the frontal lobe. So this is the area where it's being disrupted, and this is what's being lost, okay? So they're going to have impaired memory, right? They're going to have learning um, capacity, difficulty to comprehend. So remember, the frontal lobe is the area where we have our rational thinking, our critical thinking, our decision making, our personality, um, our emotions, right? Our temperament. So these are things that we're going to see in the frontal lobe. And if this area is damaged, then we're going to definitely see an alteration of those things, right? So memory, learning, comprehension is going to be a big thing. 
They're going to be easily frustrated, like I said before. Why? Because these are things that they used to do before that they are not doing now. So that will frustrate anyone, right? You're trying to comb your hair, you're trying to brush your teeth, and you can't do it because you can't lift your arms or you can't, you can't express yourself, okay? So that can lead them to depression, right? A lack of cooperation and emotional liability. Um, liability, which pretty much means that, you know, they're up, they're down, they're up, they're down, you know, and with these type of patients, you definitely want to be more supportive, more caring, um, more encouraging, you know, because these are the patients who are going to need that extra patience, that extra time, right, and to educate the family members or let them know that, hey, you know, you know, um, encourage them about their strength, they'll talk about their strength, you know, they'll talk about their lack as far as, oh, you can't lift your left arm. Say, well, you did so well lifting up your right arm, right? And those type of things are going to what? Is what's going to help make the difference of this patient being able to um, to function after rehab or even during rehab. And I put here that they get frustrated, especially with rehab, because in rehab is where they see their deficits. You know, it's like a, a no escaping zone because you see what you can and cannot do. Okay, and that can frustrate you, especially if you want to accomplish that task and you're not able to, okay? And then quickly, I have a little acronym here that I, most of you guys should know, at least you'll see it in the hospital. They'll have, they'll have signs about it, especially if you go into the neuro ICU area. You're gonna see this thing called FAST, okay? F is for facial drooping, arm is for arm drift, and what that means by that is when you're, there's a part in your assessment where you're checking for, um, um, the stroke scale and there's a part where you have the arm straight out like this and they're supposed to be able to leave it like that for 10 seconds completely straight it shouldn't drift down right or the minute you lift it up it just drops straight down it should not do that okay so you want to make sure you're looking for the arm drift and that's what that means S is for slurred speech right because if I have facial drooping on one side I mean one side is lower than the other and <clears throat> Remember, we have speech that's going to be affected, so they're not going to be speaking as clear as we, you know, would like them to. And so, that that times that can come off as a slurred type of speech, okay? And sometimes um, it takes practice time and time again seeing a stroke patient to know when they're slurring their words and when they're just talking slow, okay? Because sometimes when you someone talks slow, it sounds like they're slurring, but um, you'll, you'll begin to see when a person is slurring their speech, okay? It can be very subtle, it can be very pronounced, and you can tell, you know, um, especially if it's very pronounced, okay? But sometimes they do have subtle slurring here and there. It may not be all of the sentences, but certain words they may slur, okay? And then T is for time. It is time to act, right? Because remember, we have 1.9 million cells um, um, neurons that are pretty much being destroyed or are dying off, right? And it's that one minute that you're not taking care of their stroke. So you have to act very, very quickly because once those neurons are gone, remember they do not come back, right? They do not go through the process of mitosis where they're regenerated and they can bring back what is there, okay? That does not work. Once they're there and they're gone, they are gone. All right, so this is a cool way to kind of remember the main components of what a stroke consists of. And then I just went through in depth, each step by step, letting you know in which areas are you going to find damage and what are those damage going to be, okay? So remember those terms because they like to throw them out on test day. And remember the losses that they're gonna be experiencing. So now this is a more simplified way of knowing of knowing exactly what's happening on the right side of the brain and what's happening on the left side of the brain. All right. So after we just finished going over all the losses and different deficits that you're going to experience, now it's going to make sense once you see it here because you know exactly where it's coming from. All right. So on the right side of the brain damage, right, you see here I highlighted this is the right side of the brain that's affected, right? but it's affecting the left side of the body, okay? We're here on the left side brain damage, right? This is the left side that's affected, but the right side is where you're gonna see the deficits, okay? And that's because the brain is opposite, okay? The, the, the right hemisphere works for the left and the left hemisphere works for the right, okay? So as you can see here, right, you're going to have paralysis or weakness on the left side, whereas left side you're gonna see paralysis and weakness on the right side. Okay, you're gonna have left 
visual field deficit, right? Which is why I was telling you with the eye, the eye is going to be the paralyzed side. That's the side that, that the eye is going to be affected. Okay, so it's going to be left visual field deficit. And then you have right visual deficit. Okay, so on the right side of the eye is going to be the one that's going to be affected, which coincide with the right side damage. Okay, then now you're going to have spatial perceptual deficits. Remember, I just went over that, right? So that is going to be a right sided brain damage. Okay, on the left side, you're going to have aphasia. Remember we went over aphasia? You had three different types, right? And any language or speech deficit, that is left-sided brain damage. Then you have a increase in distractibility, which pretty much means they have a short attention span, right? They're, they're on the go, on the go, on the go. And they have a rapid performance. They like to do things fast and quick, right? Whereas here, they have an altered intellectual ability. Remember we went over that, right? The cognitive part. And they have a decrease in comprehension to math, okay? And they're going to have slow, cautious behavior. Where here, they had rapid performance. Over here, they're going to have slow, cautious behavior, all right? Now, they're going to have an impulsive behavior, right? And what you want to watch out for is safety problems, right? Because they have poor judgment. So, again, you want to make sure that you're providing safety. And then they're also going to have a lack of awareness of their deficits. So they'll deny or minimize their problems of even having any deficits, right? They won't come into acknowledgement of it. Whereas here, they are aware of their deficits, okay? And at times, at, the, at times, it can lead them to be depressed or have anxiety, thinking that, you know, they won't ever be able to function properly or function the way how they were before, okay? And then here, they're going to have an impaired time concept, and the last but not least on this side, an impaired right and left uh, discrimination. So they're not going to be able to tell the right from the left. And remember, we went over that. The, the term was called uh, peri, peri oxidative, op, something like this. I believe. Okay? Yeah, went over it. So that is from being able to tell the different body parts. Or so. So again, right and left discrimination, they're going to have a lack of that. And now you can see where they are going to have the loss of this. So they're not going to be able to tell the different body parts. Okay? So this is right side. This is left side. I'm going to step away just so you guys can see it. Okay, so again, this is something that's really, really important to study because they like to ask a lot of questions about these things, kind of throw you off a little bit. But as long as you're able to see the differences between right and left, you should kind of be able to gauge. And just remember to go over the losses again and see the different losses and where they're happening on which side. So then now when you see these terms, you are able to know exactly what those losses are describing or talking about. So now we're going to go ahead and talk about the diagnostic testing, right? Because you want to know exactly how can I know if, if the patient is really having a stroke. So the initial test that they do is pretty much a CT scan. And as I went over before in my other video in the IICP, in, in increasing to cranial pressure, I went in depth and I talked about what a CT scan is. The one-dimensional uh, testing that they would use, you have to keep still. It takes about 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, it's a non-invasive procedure, so there's times where you don't really need a consent for a CT scan unless it's with contrast or so. And this is the first test that they're going to do. It's a lot cheaper. It's almost as if you're doing a chest x-ray or an x-ray, okay? It's just a more high-tech x-ray with computerized imaging, okay? And then you have a 12 lead ECG or EKG. You take your pick but it's an echocardiogram. Um, this is the new way of how they want to say it, ECG. So if you see ECG, it's the same thing as EKG, all right? And a carotid ultrasound, and the abbreviation for ultrasound is pretty much US, so if you ever go into the hospital setting and you see the word US, it's not the United States of America, it is for ultrasound. And these are your standard testing that you would do when a patient comes in that has symptoms exhibiting a stroke, okay? Then you have a cephalo, uh, graphy, okay, which is pretty much uh, almost as if like a, a grafting of the of the brain, okay, if you if you would say, okay, and then which is this uh, 
what you have MRI or M, um, MRA, okay? And the MRA is pretty much magnetic resonance angiography, okay? And then this one is um, magnetic resonance imaging. And I also went in depth letting you know that you need consent for this one, that you want to make sure that the patient doesn't have any metal, right? You want to make sure that they're not claustrophobic. If so, you may want to give them sedation medication. So this is a longer test. It takes 45 minutes to an hour, depending on what they're looking for. Um, you want to make sure that they don't have any pacemakers, and if they do, that it's compatible. You want to make sure you call Medtronics to get those settings, just in case they go in the machine and it clears out the pacemaker settings, that they're there, that they can have it. So you want to make sure that you consult a cardiologist so that they are aware and they know the settings that needs to be for, um, set for the pacemaker, depending on the patient. Uh, and you also want to make sure that if it's for contrast, you want to make sure that they're not allergic to the dye. Same thing for CT, that they're not allergic to the dye and um, that their blood and creatinine levels are okay because those are the um, lab levels that they're, that they're gonna wanna see because that tells you kidney function because the kidney eventually has to filter out this dye, okay? So you also have transcranial Doppler, all right? And what a transcranial Doppler is, it's pretty much a testing that is going to look to see if there is any um, basal spasm activity going on, okay? And I said before, they give a medication called Nemotop to kind of prevent spasm. It's an anti-spasm uh, medication and they give this because um, your patients who have your hemorrhagic strokes, they're more prone to having seizures and, and basal spasms and those sort of things, okay? And then last but not least, you have the transesophageal echocardiography, which is also known as TEE. So if you ever see these abbreviations, this is the testing that they're talking about here and pretty much it's, a, it's like a, a, a scope it kind of goes down along the lines of your esophagus, right? And eventually makes its way where it's able to see a visualized, almost looks like a, 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 a sonogram. And pretty much it kind of highlights where in the heart, um, the different colors, where the blood flow is going through and things like that. So it's a, it's a cardiac testing, but it's just letting you know that they're going through the esophagus region um, in order to get to, to the heart. So um, it's a really cool test. I've seen it before um, with the in the patient's room. Pretty interesting to see um, the heart, the different things that uh, the different components of the heart. Okay. So these are the testing that they're going to uh, do to see if this patient um, is really having a brain attack, which is a stroke, right? And if they need to call a stroke alert or a brain attack. But for the most part, I always hear in my hospital they call it stroke alert which pretty much means everyone is now acting fast. So now we're gonna move on to the complications and management, right? And this is for typically the ischemic stroke. You may see some qualities in this, um, in this set of complications in a hemorrhagic stroke, but I'll get on another slide and talk about the hemorrhagic stroke and the main complications that you're going to see with hemorrhagic stroke. But these are some of the main complications you're gonna see with ischemic stroke, okay? So you have a lack of oxygen to the brain, which is going to equal your cell death. And if the cell dies and the neurons are dying, right, I'm going to have even more deficits. So next we have urinary tract infections, right, because these patients, they're going to have problems with uh, removal of um, bowel and urination. So most likely they may have to have a Foley inserted or so, and of course anything going in into the body right, is always going to be at risk for infection because it's a foreign body object. Not only that, but you have to now go, is a pathway into the body, so again, a risk for higher infections. So you're going to have more uh, or high risk for urinary tract infections, okay, with, with the Foley catheter. We also have cardiac dysrhythmia, right? You have complication of immobility, and when they say complication of immobility, mainly they're talking about contractions or Pressure also, because if I'm not moving, what's happening? My body's not able to rotate on each side. The skin begins to break down, right, because of the pressure, on, especially on those bony areas like your elbows and your sacrum area, right? Those type of areas, you're going to find more, um, more wounds in those areas because it's a bony prominence. So um, it's more so the complications of immobility because if you have a wound, now the skin is exposed, which gives you more risk for infection. Um, delay in healing, right? Um, if you're contracted, right? Before you just only had a weakness, now you're contracted because you're not moving. So you want to make sure that you don't develop this type of complication, okay? 
And then you have risk for aspiration pneumonia. And pretty much they're at risk for this because at the end of the day, they're going to have respiratory problems, right? Um, they have increased fluid. Um, they're probably going to be vent on a ventilator or a mechanical um, life support machine or so that eventually they may have drooling, they may have secretions, they may have different things that's going to cause the aspiration pneumonia, all right? So you want to make sure that you're doing your mouth care, you're doing your suctioning when you need to do it, um, and you're just monitoring the patient respiration rate and see exactly what's going on, all right? Also, you want to manage adequate oxygenation, okay? So again, as you can see here, I put number one is oxygen because, like I said before, if you do not have a breathing patient, you do not have a alive patient, and you want to make sure you have an alive patient. So you want to make sure that you're managing, right, oxygenation. You want to maintain a patent airway. That is the number one thing. And if you see any question that has anything with airway, most of the time, 10 times out of 10, you are going to see airway as the answer. I'm just letting you guys know. Airway is very, very important. Remember your ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, right? I'm not going to worry about circulation if my patient cannot breathe, right? What good is it that I have your blood circulating, but you, you can't breathe, and therefore you're dead? So you want to make sure um, when, you're, when you're doing uh, your questions and you're, you're reading them, make sure you think about it and say which one of these is most um, um, and most important, which one is a priority. Because sometimes you'll have a list of questions, and they can be all right, right? There will be all these complications, but they'll say, which, which complications should the nurse be more concerned with or more aware of, right? Uh, or, or should prioritize, right? So that lets you know that, yes, they can all be right, but which one is the most, 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 most important, right? And it's oxygen, 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 maintaining a patent airway, okay? So just remember that when you're taking your test, most of the time, that is the answer, right? Because a, a non-breathing patient is a dead patient. And if I have a dead patient, I have no patient, okay? So you want to make sure that you have an alive and breathing patient. So now we're going to see the complications in a hemorrhagic stroke, okay? The main complication that you're going to see. So the main complication is re-bleeding, right? Because a re-bleed is only going to cause what? Increased intracranial pressure, which we do not want. And it's going to cause even more damage, which eventually results in a herniation if it gets to that point, right? You also have a hematoma expansion. So sometimes it's just an area where um, there's, just, there's just blood in one specific area, right? But what happens? You continue to bleed in that area, and that hematoma begins to expand. So you want to make sure that you're, you're checking and monitoring these patients for those signs and symptoms of... Um, Increase into cranial pressure or signs of a re-bleeding and things like that because you're going to see the early stages and the late stages, which I went over in another video, and, and increase into cranial pressure. So if you guys need more information, please watch those videos because it will definitely come in handy um, as far as you progress into your um, nursing classes because everything begins to tie together, all right? You also have cerebral vasospasms, spasms, all right, which we talked about. Uh, we have seizures, right, because those spasms, eventually, you're going to have your seizure activity, right, which they give Keppra to kind of prevent. So a patient who has a stroke or so, you're going to see them probably prescribe some type of anti-seizure medication because they know that they're at risk for it. So you want to be proactive, not reactive, and you want to do something to prevent, not um, always treat, all right? Prevention is better than cure. So... Uh, and the last but not least, acute hydrocephalus, which I spoke about before. It's an increase in the CSF. In some patients, they will have VP shunts placed because um, some people are just born with just an overproduction of it or there's a blockage somewhere or a narrowing somewhere that kind of builds up. But in this case, right, the reason why you have an increase is because it can be possibly due to a blood obstruction. And with that blood obstruction, it causes a lack of the reabsorption of the CSF fluid um, a fluid, which is pretty much cerebral spinal fluid. Sorry, I didn't uh, say what it stands for. But CSF is cerebral spinal fluid, okay? And with that, you have a uh, lack of reabsorption. So because it's not being reabsorbed, it begins to pull and pull and pull, and then you have an increase, okay? So 
Um, these things can be monitored based on watching the patient's activity, how they how their um, um, how they function, and what's their level of consciousness. And again, your diagnostic testing can also show you if there's going to be an increase. And most of the time, these patients they will have several CTs. I know um, working in the neuro ICU. Uh, we do, if, it, if the patient is a stroke patient or they have certain protocols that the hospital provides that we follow and almost every every day around 6 a.m. we'll go ahead and do a CT scan. Okay, so we'll take the patient, they'll have daily CT scans up until a specific point or up until the doctor sees it or says, hey, you don't have to do any more CT scans. And then from there you can see if the bleeding has gotten worse, if it's improving, okay? So these are some testing that are going to be beneficial um, to know exactly what's going on with your patient. So now we're getting closer and closer of what we're going to do for a patient who does have a stroke. All right. So we have some surgical treatments for the ischemic stroke. All right. And one of the things you're going to do is a parotid endarnectomy. And what that is is pretty much, right, the removal of an arthroscleric plaque or thrombus from the carotid artery to prevent stroke in patients with occlusive disease of the extra cranial cerebral arteries, okay? So pretty much what they're saying is, and I'm gonna show a picture soon so that way you guys can see a visual exactly what they're doing, right? A picture is a thousand words. And pretty much what they're doing is that they're just removing the plaque that's there that's going to cause the obstruction, or they're moving the thrombus that is going to cause the obstruction or is already causing the obstruction. Okay, so just know that it's the removal of the thrombus or the plaque or the obstructing material, right? That's mostly going to be somewhere along the lines of the carotid, all right? The carotid arteries. Then you have here, they're going to do this procedure for signs and symptoms of TIA or mild strokes um, from the carotid artery stenosis. So there's sometimes too that uh, you have a narrowing of the carotid artery as is. And sometimes the fact that they're so narrow, um, it can obstruct blood flow. So they may put um, uh, um, um, whitening in that area, or it can be a stenosis because of plaque, okay? So uh, sometimes it's a narrowing because there's plaque there, and once you remove the plaque, we're back to normal, okay? So that's when they're gonna do this procedure. And the next procedure that they have is carotid stenting with or without angioplasty. Okay, and pretty much what this is, this is for severe stenosis, where, you know, um, when you put the stent, the stent prevents the artery from closing back up as quickly or um, at all. So you want to make sure that it's like a wire mesh, okay, that they use. And what it does is once they clear out that area, they put the stent there, the stent stay, keeps the, the, the arteries open. And of course, because they have the stent, you don't want, it's almost as if like, like a, a gate, one of those uh, metal gates or so, and it has like different crosses in it, and it just, it just um, like X's, right? Those type of gates. Um, pretty much that's what the mesh looks like. So think of that in a, uh, on an oval area, and pretty much, or cylinder shape, and they're putting that pretty much in the vessel to kind of keep it open. Now, blood clots and everything can kind of get in, in between those grooves, right, of the gate or the stent, and these type of patients, you're gonna see them on blood thinners, okay? Just so that it can kind of thin out the blood so that way the, the clots doesn't kind of pile up or the blood doesn't pile up on that, on the gate, okay, the stents. So uh, that's one thing that you wanna watch out for with patients who are having the carotid stenting done, and pretty much they're gonna do this procedure um, because it's less invasive and they're gonna do it for Patients who are at higher risk for surgery. So those who can't really, um, uh, aren't really stable for the actual endarctomy, the surgery of opening up um, those, those, um, those arteries in the neck, they will go ahead and they will pretty much fish a wire either in the radial or the femoral artery and fish a wire all the way up so they get to the neck area. And then from there, they will do the, the stenting, okay? So it's a less invasive procedure, and they will use it more if you are at risk for complications for surgery, okay? And then the complications of endarctomy. Again, I want you guys to go ahead and look at the description box below. 
the, the description box is very, very helpful. It gives a lot of information that I may not always mention in the videos or just background information that you guys need to know or things that you guys are interested in, um, in knowing or um, things to watch out for for your testing. So if you guys get a chance, please look at the description box to see the complications of the endarctectomy and also just more um, guidance to knowing how to navigate through these videos, okay? I also put helpful tips in there to know exactly where to go for the next video. All right? Okay. So, so now we're going to talk about the surgical treatments for a hemorrhagic stroke, okay? So in most cases for uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, they're not going to really do surgery because again, to open you up to do surgery is going to cause bleeding and you're already bleeding. So they will try not to do surgery and see if it can resolve on its own. Uh, again, they may give medication and different things like that, but surgery, most of the time, they kind of want to wait out on surgery. All right, but if the condition worsens, right, and you have a Glasgow Coma Scale, all right, so when you see GCS, that's Glasgow Coma Scale, right, is decreasing, right, and the hematoma exceeds three centimeters, okay, and surgical evacuation is recommended. Doesn't mean that they, they will still do it all the time, but it is recommended, okay, and it is accomplished through a craniotomy. So if you want more information on craniotomy, please check out my uh, lecture on increased intracranial pressure. You'll find all the information you need to know about a craniotomy, okay? Also, you have an intracranial aneurysm, okay? And I'm going to talk about what an aneurysm is in just a sec, okay? And pretty much, you will have surgery once it is stable, once the aneurysm is stable, once the patient is stable, the vitals are stable, all right? So if the aneurysm ruptures, right, the goal is to reduce the bleeding in the surgery, right? Because it's already bleeding, the only thing that you can do is try to reduce the bleeding. And if it isn't ruptured, right, it is unruptured, then the goal is to prevent it from rupturing, all right? So now I'm going to go ahead and talk to you about what an aneurysm is so then you can kind of see um, how they treat it, okay? So here I have my vessel. Right? This is my vessel, and an uh, aneurysm can happen because of uh, increased blood pressure or weakening of the wall. So pretty much, right, you have a normal blood vessel that looks similar to this. And this is my blood going through to the different organs, right? Now this is a vessel with a weakened wall, right, and it loses, it loses its, um, is elasticity and it's just kind of like stretched out, right? And it bulges in this area here. So this is your this is your aneurysm right here. So what happens is the blood is traveling through, and instead of going instead of going straight down, right? The blood then says, "Hey, I have a little bit of room here." Right? Some may go down this way, but others begin to pull. And then when this pulls and pulls and pulls, right? And pulls and pulls and pulls and pulls. Eventually, the wall is already weak. That's the reason why it's bulged out, right? So now, with all of this backing up, right? Eventually, what happens? This wall begins to break. And then, the bleeding occurs, okay? And once that bleeding occurs, I have a ruptured aneurysm, and that's happening in the brain, and guess what? It can cause your hemorrhagic stroke, okay? So aneurysms can contribute to a hemorrhagic stroke, all right? Because eventually it breaks away, the blood is still coming through, but it pushes and pushes against that wall to finally eruption. So the line of the blood is no longer circulating the rest of the body, right? So the cells down here are dying, and the blood is escaping into the tissues, and eventually is going to increase the intracranial pressure, and voila, your hemorrhagic stroke, okay? So again, if you guys have been um, going around and you've been studying, and you've looked around in the book, and you haven't seen any aneurysm or anything about aneurysm, now you guys know what an aneurysm is how it can contribute to a stroke, and now I'm going to discuss how you treat the aneurysm, okay? So this is the case of your aneurysm. 
All right, and the goal of the game is to pretty much, right, stop it from rupturing, right? That is the goal. So, now we're going to go ahead and continue. So, what do you want to do to fix the aneurysm, right? So you want to isolate the aneurysm by either a ligature or a clip across the neck of the aneurysm, okay? Or you can do, uh, aneur the aneurysm can be reinforced with a wrapping of some, of some substance to provide support and induce scarring, right? So you might say, why would you want to do that? All right, so pretty much today, let's go with the first one where it says uh, you want to isolate the aneurysm, right? So you want to isolate the aneurysm here. And you can do a ligature or a clip. Um, in my hospital, well, I've seen most of the doctors, they'll do clipping or coiling, which I'll get to the coiling. But let me just show you what they mean when they're saying a clip. They take literally a metal clip, right? And what they do is they clip this area here and put a clip right there. So with that clip in place, right, the, bl the blood cannot, can no longer go into that bulging area. Right? It can't go into that bulging area, so now the blood is redirected back down and can flow where it needs to go. Okay? So that's one of the procedures that they can do, and that's isolating the, the, anu the aneurysm because you're trying to leave it out by itself. Okay? So you reinforce it with the clip, and now the blood can be redirected. All right? So that's that one. All right? So let's continue to read. So then you have an endovascular treatment. This is your newer treatment set that, that the uh, newer surgeons are now doing. And pretty much what it is, it's the occlusion of the parent artery. And then you have the aneurysm coiling, all right, which is also our newer technique and a way of how they um, treat the aneurysm. And what it is, is an obstruction of the aneurysm with a coil, all right? Now I'm going to show you that here. I have my aneurysm here again. This is my aneurysm. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to fish, right, whether in the right in the, uh, in the femoral artery or in the brachial, right, I mean the radial. And what I'm going to do is travel that wire in. I'm going to then release the coils. Let me put in a different color. And you can actually see what's going on here. Okay. And pretty much, I'm going to show it out here, but I'm going to do it in there. It just coils like this until the aneurysm is completely blocked. Okay? So coils, just like that, coils until it is blocked. So that's pretty much what I'm drawing in here. It's coils. So finally, right, the blood can no longer come this way because it's blocked, and now the blood can go down the original path that it was supposed to be going down. All right? So those are ways that you can fix an aneurysm. So now that you guys know what an aneurysm is, this is certain procedures that you can do to kind of help with the aneurysm. All right? And again, if you want to see the complications or know more about the complications for these things, okay, please see the description box below this video. Okay, and also in the description box, I'm also going to add the stroke scale. So those of you guys who would like to see what a stroke scale looks like and the point system, I will have that down below in the, in the description box. I will also have information about um, aneurysm if you guys want to know just a little bit more if this wasn't clear enough. And then also, too, I'm going to see if I can add some um, YouTube link videos of animated uh, procedures that you can see. And I remember one time when I was when I was in nursing school, what I used to do when I would see the surgical procedures or things like that, I would like to go to YouTube and put the animated version in, right, of what that procedure is and just kind of watch like the cartoon effect. Because sometimes in real life when you actually see the real uh, human being, it doesn't look the same, it doesn't look as perfect as the book. So I like to get that image in my head so now I know exactly 
what that procedure is, what they're doing, and how it's fixing the problem, okay? So I'm gonna see if I can get some videos about aneurysms and certain things like that and put them in the description box below, so please check it out. All right, now we're at the meat and the potatoes, right? As far as what the nurse should do. So we're gonna talk about nurse intervention for an ischemic stroke, and I know I wrote ischemic stroke, but um, I think that this is also for hemorrhagic stroke as well, even though um, going over the book in the Brunner Sadar uh, book, it has it under extreme ischemic stroke, but there are some things here that you will see that you will have to do with a hemorrhagic stroke because if they have those deficits, then you eventually still have to maintain and control and prevent or um, preserve whatever is left of that functioning of that organ or um, the patient's ability, okay? So um, I think this is probably pertaining more to ischemic stroke, but doesn't exclude hemorrhagic stroke, okay? So just be aware of those things, but Nevertheless, these are things that you want to do as a nurse, all right? So first up is improving mobility and preventing joint deformities, okay? So pretty much what they mean about joint deformities is, you know, the contractions and um, things like that as far as uh, shoulder displacement, right? Because the patient's not able to move, you know, and you, you don't want to damage um, the mobility as it is already in a, a great um, a lack of. So with that said, there's a picture in the book where it shows that the, the patient has a pillow, right? Because you want to prevent abduction. And how I remember abduction against ad abduction is you have A, B, D, right? And that one's to go away from the body. Abduction, A, D, D, right? I'm, I'm going to add to the body. That's how I remember it. So adduction is this way. So you don't want the patient's arm to be stuck in adduction, right? So what you want to do is that you want to place the pillow here so it kind of um, give, it, give it room, okay? And then again with the fingers, palm of the hands, you want to make sure that the palm is facing forward, right? So you don't want it digging into the bed like this. You want it to be faced upward, okay? So that's this one. Next thing, you want to change position. Okay, so you want to change position or changing position, right? And you want to change every Q2 hours, all right? That is standard for most hospitals. But again, you will want to follow your hospital policy. But I know it to be every two hours, and the book also stated every two hours. So just make sure that you're turning them, all right? The same way how you would sleep in the middle of the night and you'll toss and turn, right? Even though you may not know that you're, that, that you're doing it, your body is doing it, okay? So you want to be able to be that for the patient because they're not able to move themselves. And this is going to help them prevent a lot of bed sores and maintain their skin integrity, right? And prevent any contraction or uh, more deformities within um, the motor function, okay? Part of it. So prone helps to prevent hip flexion. So sometimes you want to put them prone and prone is pretty much be on stomach down, okay? And with that, you want to help with um, the hip flexion, okay? Because you don't want the hip to rotate outward, okay? That's a big no no. So, uh, again, preparing for ambulation, right? As soon as possible. So, as soon as possible, as long as the patient is stable, they're capable of, you want to get them up and going. Why? Because your joints only get more brittle and more fragile as you age. And those people who have been on bed rest for a long time, eventually you, you lose that muscle memory. Not muscle memory, but you lose that uh, ability to be able to move with certain certain limbs because um, there's this tightness and joint um, stiffness that occurs in those areas where they're not as flexible as they used to be. And so it takes you twice as long to get out of bed and to move, okay, which can um, cause the, the deterioration process to happen a lot quicker. So you want to get them out as soon as possible, all right, and you want to be able to start rehab. They're going to be with the physical therapist, okay, and pretty much when they go to physical therapist, right, the patient should be able to be practicing balancing, right? Most of the time the book says if they're able to stand and balance, then they're, they're, they're one step closer into walking, okay, because you need to have balance when you're walking. So if you're able to stand and balance, that's another step closer into walking, okay? So they'll try to do both, balancing on something or with something, right? And then have you balance trying to sit back down and then standing up again, okay? They also have tilt tables, parallel bars as you're walking, right, to kind of um, guide you, 
right? They have, uh, and then you also want to have chairs there available just in case they do get dizzy, right? And then, or, or they're about to fall, they can lean on something and ease their way down to the floor, okay, if need be. Next thing is enhancing self-care. And pretty much what that is, is just keeping up with yourself, right? And, uh, proper grooming. You want to make sure that, you know, you have your personal hygiene, that you smell good, that you're bathing and things like that. And your ADLs. The ADL stands for Activities of Daily Living. And those activities of daily living is brushing your teeth, combing your hair, eating, right, taking a bath, taking a shower. So um, different functions throughout the day that you would do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So those are your ADLs, and you want to make sure that the goal is to get them to do as much ADLs as possible. As, as much as much as they have deficits, I want to make, make sure that they're able to maintain a good quality of life and still be able to do certain activities. So that is your goal as a nurse, is to kind of bring them back to where they used to be, okay? And if they can't do everything that they used to be, bring them back to a point where they're still functional, okay? Into society and they can still have a quality of life and they can do different things, okay? So uh, you also want to be managing your sensory percep um, perceptual. And pretty much what that means is when you have the patient, right, they're not able to stay. They may have a left field visual that's completely gone or right field visual that's completely gone. Or they may not be able to tell, um, you know, distance and, 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 and space, right? So what you want to do is this is a big key thing, right, because they ask questions about this. Questions, questions, questions. So, you know, your, your tingling senses should be on, on guard, okay? So you want to approach the patient on the side of the visual field that's intact, all right? You want to, let me say that again, you want to approach the patient on the side of where they have the visual that's intact. So their good side, you want to come on their good side, right? You want to put the clock on their good side. You want to put the calendar on their good side, the TV on their good side, okay? You want to put it all on the intact side so that way the patient can see. Sometimes, you know, you may start a patient, they can't see completely on this side, and you come in from this way and you just start talking, that can startle someone, right? So they like to always ask those type of questions, which side do you come on, you know, if a patient has a visual field that's, you know, not intact, you come on the the opposite side or you come on the intact side okay so again you come on the intact side all right and you have a term here that is also good to know I don't know if they will ask that question but hey doesn't hurt to be prepared if they do or if they use it in the sentence and you're like what is that all right and a morphosynthesis and pretty much what that means is to neglect that side or space so sometimes when you're not able to see from that visual field, this is all your vision. And you don't think about turning to see where the rest of the room is or where that space is. And with constant neglect, 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 right? You create something where um, you don't have that, 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 that area anymore. Sometimes because you're not using that function, you can lose it. So now you can't turn that in that, in that direction, right? Your head can't turn this way. Right, because you haven't done it in so long that now you literally have to turn your whole body around just to see where that visual point is, right? So instead of just turning, right, you have to turn your whole body. So you want to prevent that. So what the nurses can do as a goal, right, is first you want to remind them when they do have their food, right, remind them that uh, the food is on the other side. So you want to let them know, say, hey, I know you can see half of your food, but just want to let you know there is food on the other side. So you want to train them to turn that way, and that way they can see, okay? So you want to train them to do that. You also want to let them know, right? You want to put items on the weak side, right, or the side that's absent, and you want them to remind them. But don't, don't put it there and not tell them. Put it there and remind them. Say, hey, uh, you know, John Doe, your phone is on your left side, right? And let's say the left side is the is the side that they're that they're that, that's not intact, right? So they say phone on the left side, right? They know this is their left, they're gonna turn to the left. Alright? So that way you're you're training them, you're practicing with them to hey still turn that way, okay? Because you don't want it to be locked. 
So you want them to be able to still turn and do what they have to do, right? So the nurse needs to remind them, right, of the patient's item and to also help encourage them to turn to the affected side, all right? That is the goal because you want to prevent this from occurring. So sometimes on the question for, you know, the testing, they may say, oh, what should the nurse do? And you may say, oh, put it on the, on the bad side, right, because you want to encourage but sometimes they say when the nurse is entering a room or she's bringing items to the patient, which side do you want it on? The, the side that's intact, okay? Oh, no, you only do this part that's in purple, and I put it in purple to distinguish from the first one, but you only want to do the part in purple as an encouragement. But when they ask you questions of what side should the nurse put the food tray on, what side should the nurse um, um, enter into or put personal items, it's always the intact side, the intact side, the intact side. Now, if they say the nurses should encourage the patient to prevent this complication, what should the nurse do? Then, yes, put it on the weak side. Put it on the side that it is absent. And remind them, the key thing is to remind them, hey, John Doe, Susie, right, turn to your right. Your, your phone is on your right or your drink is on your right or your shoes or whatever personal item, your glasses are on, on your right or on your left, okay, whichever side is the um, defected side. Okay. okay, so the last thing is you have, you want to obtain bowel and bladder control. And what this is, is pretty much um, you want to prevent the complication that they probably will have, which some of them will have a loss of bladder feeling sensation, so they don't feel when they have to go to the bathroom, they don't feel that sensation of, hey, my bladder is full, right? So they may end up leaking and cause incontinence. And then also bladder and tonic, which is pretty much A means none, no tone, right? So the bladder doesn't have any tone whatsoever. So to prevent these things or to kind of um, stabilize these things, you want to provide a Foley catheter, which you're going to use sterile technique, those of you guys who remember doing your uh, Foley catheter in nursing skills classes. Right? It's a sterile technique that you want to use when you're inserting. You have 30 days um, to, uh, for every new folding that you will have to have. So if one folding can last for 30 days. After that, you need a new one. And um, remember, you want to follow your hospital policy. Some hospitals, you don't need, uh, once you already put the folding order in, you don't need to keep updating it. You just only need to just put an order to DC it whenever time the doctor wants to see it. Other hospitals, um, they do daily. Of or orders of fold. I know at my hospital is a daily order of folding, so uh, otherwise it cons it's considered a fallout within the hospital. So you want to make sure that you're following your hospital policy when it comes to the foley and you know the, the care of the foley and how long the foley is allowed to stay in the patient. Okay, and one thing with the bowel function is that they may cause constipation. So again, with the constipation, if they're able to have a diet. And that, and you know, because they are going to have problems with swallowing, but if they can have a diet, you want to make sure that they're on a high fiber diet so that way they're able to go to the bathroom, okay, and be able to move those bowels the way how they're supposed to be moving, okay. So, this is your bladder attainment that you want to have, and they may not have the Foley for that long, eventually, it may regain the bladder, may have need time to rest once it's rested and the body is healing. They may not be able to need the, the foley anymore because they regain those those abilities, right? They're able to control their their spencer that controls them to, to use the restroom so they're no longer incontinent. And they may regain sensation of their bladder being full. So it all depends on how how uh, how far gone the deficits occurred and the strength of how much um, rehab is needed to take to put into those those uh, exercises to regain the ability of these things that were once there but has now been altered. So your goal as a nurse is to pretty much maintain or improve the status of where the deficit right, so is. Now we're going to continue on with interventions. Okay, so you want to assist with, with nutrition. And pretty much the patient is probably going to have some type of swallowing problems, right, because they already have the facial drooping on one side, right, numbness to one side. So they only have one side that they're able to chew or sometimes they're not able to chew at all. So with that, you will have a speech therapist who's going to come on board with the health um, care team. And the, she will then do the swallow eval per doctor's order. So you don't just do a swallow eval just because you want to make sure you have a, a, a doctor's order. Now, certain hospitals, they may do a dysphagia screening to see if the patient is able to swallow. Now, uh, 
I know in, 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 at my hospital, we do do dysphagia screenings where we'll have a little bedside swallow evaluation at the bedside with the nurse. And pretty much I'll give a cup of water. And um, with the cup of water, I'll take two, like teaspoons or so and have them drink uh, and sip, sip that. And if they're able to um, swallow with no problem, then I continue on and give them sips of, of water with, through a straw or give them ice, okay? And then you can slowly advance, give maybe like an applesauce or um, apple juice or something like that that they can have in the meantime until they're able to do the official swallow about in, in the morning. But so at my house, what we do do it, it's called a dysphagia screening. And it's pretty much to see if they're able to swallow right then and there. So maybe they can take their medications and things like that. All right, so you want to check with your hospital policy on the things that you guys are provided to do and are able to do, okay? So uh, swallow eval is done by the speech therapist, and they will come in per doctor's order and see if the patient is able to swallow. So they'll have a series of different things, a uh, uh, cookie, banana, uh, water, and different things like that. So they'll work their way with the easiest things to swallow, to, and then finally work its way to the hardest thing to swallow, OK, and see how well the patient does. Based on where the patient is at, they will be given a diet. Now with the diet, um, most patients that are on a stroke that are had a stroke, right? Their diet is typically a thick liquid or a pureed diet at first, and then from there they will advance it as tolerated. So you could probably end up being on a mechanical uh, diet where uh, it's chopped up pieces of your food in there, but it's still kind of smushed in a way. Okay, so um, you know a bland diet work its way up to a cardiac diet or whatever it is the diet that you need to be on, or if you're able to be on a regular diet, then eventually a regular diet. Now. Uh, that doesn't mean that everyone is going to advance. Some people will stay at a diet, a permanent diet, that this is their safety measure and this is what they're able to do, okay? Now, if they're not able to swallow at all, right, you want to make sure that the patient's still getting some type of nutrition because days are going to pass by and they're going to need to eat something. So you have an NG2, uh, NG all right, or NGT, okay, and that pretty much stands for nasal gastric tube, or you can have an OGT, which is an oral gastric tube, and pretty much, don't get confused with because it's two different names, it is the same device, the same device that you guys have in your nursing skills that you guys practice on, on the NG insertion, right, is the same exact tube, the only thing is that instead of going in the, the nose, you're going to go in the mouth, okay, it, it's a lot easier, and, um, you know, you'll mostly see these with your patients who are venting or on a mechanical ventilator or life support machine, okay? Or you can have a dub Hoff tubing. And a dub Hoff tubing is pretty much like a smaller NG tube. It comes um, fissured with a wire. And pretty much some facilities, they have it where they have a scope to kind of guide you down so that you know exactly when it's in the stomach. And then you pull, you, you, leave, you leave the wire in there. The x-ray uh, will come to verify the placement. Once they verify that placement, then you pull out that wire, okay, and then you can discard it. But you never take it out before inserting. You leave it in as you're inserting. Once you're finished and you x-ray have came and they confirm placement that yes, it is in the stomach, then you pull out the wire. Um, you can save it if you want to, but you don't have to. You can throw it away. And from there, you hook up your, your, your feeds, okay? So with that said, there may be times where um, the patient continues on and they fail to swallow after swallow after swallow eval. And you also want to check with your hospital policy on how many swallow valves do they do before they say, hey, this patient is for a peg, okay? So I know at our hospital, I think they give it at least three or four tries. If, if not, then the doctors will come and speak with the family, let them know, hey, this patient is not doing so well. I don't think they're going to be able to. And then also, you can do a peg and it is reversible. So you, they can start with a peg, regain, uh, strength and regain those those abilities and eventually their that peg tube can be no more and then they can start eating again so it all depends on the patient and what's going on with the patient and how bad the complications are all right so anyway we have our peg tube right and you're going to have your orders of what type of feeds they want and the goal rate right so you may have for example you may have jeopardy and they may say jeopardy 1.2 at 20 mls per hour right that's where they want it to be started and then eventually we want a goal rate of 50. So it's at 20, but we want to get to 50 mLs an hour. So you're going to use your nursing judgment to know exactly when the patient is tolerating the feeds. 
and when you need to advance a little bit more. And you want to advance very slowly. You want at least at least 10 ml each hour, or not that you have five ml each hour, or 10 ml like every two hours or three hours or so, right? Until you reach to your goal. And how you can tell that they're doing well, you want to check the residual, right? Remember, once you have the, the tubing in, you have your suction, right? Your suction canister. You're going to take that, hook it up, and you're going to aspirate. Aspirate, and if you um, don't, don't see any stomach content, or you don't see uh, um, any, any food piling back up, right? The feeding tubes piling back up, and it's pretty much empty, then you know that they have residual, um, zero residual or you know, maybe 10 ml worth of residual, but that's a good thing because it lets you know that the body is absorbing, the, the, the GI tract is working. Now if you pull back and you keep pulling, right, and you, and you dump into the canister and you pull, and you dump into the canister and you pull, you dump into the canister and you've gotten like three, 400 ml worth, right? You don't throw it away, even though some nurses they do throw it away. You take that and you put it back into the patient because some of those um, things are their stomach content. And yes, even though the body can make more, right, you don't want to take away what they already um, are, are able to produce. So you want to keep that there because remember, the body does take time to reproduce and do certain things. And also, too, that's your way of monitoring, hey, okay, I'm going to hold the feeds for now because he's not absorbing as, as fast as we would like him to. So I'm going to hold the feeds, right? And then every... I would say maybe every two, three hours, you can pull back those fluids and see, okay, it was we started at 400, we're now at 200. So you know that, hey, he is he is um, digesting the food, but it's just happening at a very slow rate, right? And you put the contents back in, and then another two hours go by, you check again, and you're like, oh, we're down to 50 ml, right? So then that's your way to gauge it, all right? So don't throw it away. I know some, some nurses, they do do that, but you don't have to throw it away. Okay, and why, why, why throw away their stomach content, right? So leave that with the food feeding, and then that way you can kind of monitor, hey, it's improving. And you don't have to worry about it being sterile because the stomach isn't something that's sterile, right? It's the same thing as eating food. When we eat food, it goes down, it goes into our stomach. It's the same thing with the stomach, okay? So you don't have to worry about, oh, I don't want to put it back in because it's not sterile, right? None of it's sterile, right? So... Now we're going to go ahead and move on. We have improving thought processes, right? And so the role of the nurse, our job, which I've said before, you want to support, be supportive. You know, you want to give positive feedback. You want to make sure that you're giving an attitude of confidence and of hope. Let them know that, hey, you did a, such a good job, Johnny. You know, you did such a good job, you know, Elizabeth, or, you know, wh wh whatever the patient name is. And just reassure them, you know. You want to capitalize and focus on the on the patient's strength, right? Say, man, you lift that right arm so high today. You know, you you was able to to stand firm on your left leg today. You know, whatever it may be, you want to capitalize on their strengths and let them know that hey, you acknowledge that they are putting in effort and that they're doing well, and that will kind of keep the patient going. Okay. Next thing is you want to improve communication. So again. The speech therapist is going to be on the healthcare team with this, and they will come in day, on a day-to-day -day basis, most of the time in the mornings, and they will come to help the patient. So with this said, um, there are some do's and don'ts that you don't want to do, and one of the do, do nots, right, is you do not want to finish the patient's thoughts or sentences. It can frustrate them, it can frustrate you, but more so you want to give the patient a chance. Sometimes, remember, when you have a little kid, and it's like they want to pour the milk, they want to open this, they want to do all this thing for themselves, right? Because they want to have the autonomy to say that I did it, right? So just remember that concept that you don't want to finish, his, finish their sentences all the time. You don't want to do that. So you want to make sure that you're giving them a chance to speak and to complete their sentences, okay? So you give them a chance and see what it is that they want, all right? Also, too, you want to have a, a consistent schedule of activities and then know what they're doing day in, day out, day in, day out. Personal information, so if they have memory loss or they have problems with their memory, you want to give them, you know, information, let them know who they are, their birthday, you know, where they live, you know, their family members or so, and just kind of keep um, jogging their memory, right? So you want to give them a consistent schedule because a routine is something that, kind of sticks time and time again and you know, okay, it, it causes less frustration because you know what's happening next. And sometimes a lot of times the patient gets frustrated because they don't know what's going on, you know, and they can't communicate with you because they don't know 
how to communicate with you, okay? Or they've lost that ability. So sometimes when you have a, a consistent schedule, they already know by 12 o'clock and they're looking at the clock, right? Whether they have, you know, whichever visual field that they have intact, they're looking at that clock and they're saying, okay, at 12 o'clock I know lunch is coming. Oh, at 11 o'clock I know I'm gonna go to the bathroom. So that kind of um, ease with the frustration of having to communicate because you have a consistent schedule that they're able to know, okay, this is happening this time, this is happening at that time. So they're kind of aware, all right? So you wanna give that ability. Also, too, you can use a communication board. Sometimes it's not the fact that they're not able to communicate. They may not be able to express words, but they can sure still write. So you want to make sure that you give them a communication board. They have a marker. And a board like this is just a smaller version, and then they can just write whatever it is that they want, erase, and tell you and lift it up. And I've definitely had a patient where she could write, and she'll tell you exactly what she wanted, okay? And she'll, knock, she'll take the board and she'll knock it on the, on the bedside to let you know, hey, what she wants, okay? So um, it does work, it comes in handy, all right? And then you also wanna have pictures of common needs, right? Pictures of a bathroom, pictures of someone eating, pictures of combing your hair, brushing your teeth. So then you can kind of pull up the picture and say, what do you wanna do today, right? And then they can kind of point, so that way you know what's going on, all right? That's also another option. All right, so now you want to, um, the nurse needs to speak clear and slowly, right? And you wanna give your attention to your patient. I know sometimes we get busy and we're charting or whatever and we're not really paying attention or we're on the computer and we're, we're logging in on the different things and you know we're not giving our full attention to the patient. They feel that, they know that, and they already have a problem with communicating. They may feel as if you're trying to neglect them. So try to give your attention to the patient, turn and look at them as they're trying to speak because they are giving that effort in trying Okay, so that should be acknowledged. Again, also, avoid speaking louder. I know at times, you know, we feel as if like, oh, a patient can't hear me or they can't understand what I'm saying. Let me speak louder, all right? 10 times out of 10, this is not the answer, all right? And you're gonna see questions like this, because I remember seeing questions like this on NCLEX and in class, right? And it said, uh, patient has trouble or difficulty communicating or things like that. What should the nurse do to kind of help enhance the communication process, right? And they will always have it, surely you will never fail. Nurse should speak louder or nurse should raise her voice or nurse should, you know, talk, talk louder or whatever. Any one of those answers, that is not the answer, okay? You do not want to speak louder. And I know it makes sense because you think that, oh, if I just speak louder, they'll hear what I'm saying. But what they're, what they're saying here is that it's not a hearing problem, right? They can hear fine. What it is is neurologically, they're not able to express or they're not able to understand, not the fact that they did not hear. So you wanna make sure that you find other ways to kind of, to kind of um, uh, enhance the communication process, whether it's you know taking pictures and having the different um, pictures of different things that they like to do or um, the common things that they're able to do, right? Or you have a communication board, some other way of device that will help to enhance. So most of the time when you see this answer, that is not the answer, right? Look and see what other options they have. So um, that's always a good advice and good tip to know is that it is never to speak louder, all right? That's, that's the way they trick you to um, make you click that answer because you think, oh yeah, just speak louder, they will hear what I'm saying. That will help enhance. No, 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 all right? So next thing, the nurse lead, I said that one already. So maintaining skin integrity, right, is, a, is one thing that you want to do because they may have problems with movement, ambulation, and you want to make sure that their skin is intact so that way they don't have skin breakdown, that they don't have infection, right? So you want to prevent complications from occurring. You also want to improve family coping, right, because if you're dealing with loved ones that you're seeing that were able to do things to get up to go to work and eat and do all these things on its own, take a bath, and now you have to be the one to do those things for this patient, right? The family now has a stress on them that they've never had before or a hardship that they have to go through, an adversity. So sometimes you just being there and coping with the family, that helps, okay? And then also too with the patient, cope with sexual dysfunction, all right? And when you're coping with the sexual dysfunction, because some people, they may need that, right? That, that, that's an important aspect in their life. It was a big thing before and it's still a big thing now. So you want to kind of listen to the patient, understand how they feel, let them express themselves, 
And also, last thing is you want to teach them self-care. You know, make sure that they're keeping up to date with grooming and, you know, all their AADLs, brushing their teeth, you know, eating, taking a, a shower if they can, right? And teach them how to do these things. Last yeah. but not least, now we're going to talk about the nurse interventions for a hemorrhagic stroke, okay? Um, the ones that I went over before can be ischemic and I think also too hemorrhagic because there are going to be some deficits that the patient are going to experience, whether they're swallowing difficulty, skin integrity, right? All those things are still going to apply to hemorrhagic stroke because they still may have weakness to one area, right? I just think that these focuses more on hemorrhagic. You won't really see most of these in the ischemic um, interventions, but the, uh, the things that are in the ischemic you will see for the hemorrhagic, if that makes any sense. Okay, so again, what I just went over before can be for ischemic and hemorrhagic, and then this is mainly solely for um, hemorrhagic, although you can see some things in here for ischemic, all right? So I'm just trying to highlight what you're going to see more with each stroke, but it doesn't mean that they don't come together and work together where you'll see some of these things because neuro checks you are going to do for an ischemic stroke. It just, you want to monitor neurological status of what's going on with the patient, right? So again, it doesn't exclude ischemic. This just pertains more to hemorrhagic, all right? So let's get started. So you want to optimize the cerebral tissue perfusion. Why? Why? Because you have a bleed. And your biggest thing is perfusion, 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 right? Because you're at increased risk for in, into, uh, increased intracranial pressure, right? Which from there, you have a lack of Perfusion. So your main thing is that you want to optimize cerebral tissue perfusion. You want to implement aneurysm precautions, right? So if they have any aneurysms or anything like that, you want to either do your clipping or you want to do your coiling, whatever process you want to do to kind of help prevent. Or if you know the patient does have uh, aneurysm but they're not stable for surgery, right? You want to um, reduce their stimuli, right? So when they say reduce stimuli, pretty much what's going on into the environment. So if the TV is playing, right, the family are, are, is way too loud, the blood pressure is going up, you know, the lights are on, they're constantly seeing different things around the room, right? You want to decrease your stimulation. So um, with that said, you want to make sure that you have your dim lights, you want to have a quiet environment, you want to have no pressure causing things as far as, you know, sneezing. If you can avoid sneezing, it will be best to avoid sneezing, okay? Um, no enemas, right? Because you have something penetrating going upward can cause pressure. <laughs> Sorry, here I am saying no sneezing, I'm sneezing, right? So you want to make sure that uh, you provide the dim lighting for the environment. You want to make sure that they're not straining, right? So, you know, when they go into the bathroom, you want to make sure, hey, do not strain. That's why you have stool softeners, you have colax, you have uh, docolax, you know, Seneca, something that can, or lax, any laxative, right? Um, magnesium or anything like that, that you can give them to kind of help them go to the bathroom so that way they're not pushing down. Because when they push down, they cause the valsalva maneuver, which eventually drops the blood pressure, but then spikes up the blood pressure as a rebound, okay? So with that, you do not want to uh, push down or bear down, okay? So you don't want to tell the patient to bear down because it's only going to increase the blood pressure, which we are already trying to control the pressure, okay? Uh, the next thing is you want to relieving sensory deprivation, right, or anxiety. So you want to make sure that you're helping the patient have a good positive attitude. You, that's why you encourage them. You try to let them know um, where they are, where the, where the goals are supposed to be, and you know, you just let them know, hey, you're not that, you're not that far away, you know, you did, you know, you're at a score of this and you were trying to get to this, whatever it may be, but you also wanted to make sure that it's encouraging, uplift them in their strengths and what they're good at doing, okay? Um, you want to monitor and manage potential complications, right? And the potential complications, like we said before, can be basal spasm, you have your seizures, you have your hydrocephalus, and you have rebleeding. And another thing that I wanted to add is hyponatremia, okay? So you can have hyponatremia because you have um, your, a, your ADH levels, all right, which are aldosterone hormone, which helps with uh, regulation of the blood pressure and things like that. And it also deals with um, sodium. It plays a part with sodium. So sometimes you can have 
or be hyponatremic, right? So you want, may want to give a hypertonic solution of 3% normal saline. Um, 3% saline, I mean. And then you have your increased intracranial pressure monitoring that you want to do. And you want to do it at least throughout the, the shift and while you're with the patient. But it's going to be very vital in that 72-hour post-stroke mark. Okay? So you want to make sure that you're checking for those things. Uh, next thing is your neurological assessment, which is also called your neurochecks. Okay, so the doctor will put in orders as far as how often he wants you to do neurochecks. Most of the time, they're coming on the unit for the first time. They may have the neurochecks Q1 hour, then it may go up to uh, Q2 hours if there's no changes, and then Q4 hours if there still isn't any changes. Okay, but you want to make sure that you are doing your neurological assessment so you can see if the patient is improving, declining, where they at, where where they are you know, on the, on the stroke scale, okay? Also, too, you want to um, increase the head of the bed, all right? So H-O-B means head of bed, all right? So uh, increase the head of the bed to 15 to 30 degrees, all right? You don't want it any higher than 30 degrees. And like I said before in uh, the IC, IICP video uh, lecture, um, it increases the pressure even more. Why? Because when something is upright, right, you have gravity pulling on that very thing that is causing the pressure, which only increases the pressure more and causes the herniation process to happen a whole lot quicker. So you want to avoid lifting, uh, um, putting the bed up to more than 30, okay? The max is 30, so 15 to 30, no more than that. So as you can see, here are your interventions that you're going to have mostly for your hemorrhagic. doesn't mean that it's not... Um, unlimited to hemorrhagic, you can also see some of these things for your ischemic as far as neuro checks, right? Um, monitoring for potential complications as far as the complications that's going to happen with the ischemic stroke, right? So there's many different things that can pertain to each other uh, as far as the strokes, but I just want you to get you to understand that with nurse intervention, your biggest job is to help decrease the losses of those uh, neurological deficits that they may have, regain some of the ability, maintain what's left, and to um, give them a quality of life that they can still manage to have. And um, the best thing is to promote self-autonomy. So that is the ultimate goal as a nurse with a patient who um, has a stroke or has a history of a stroke or experiencing one, right, at that very moment is that at the end, your goal is to make sure that you are able to give them somewhat of a self-autonomy, whether it's doing their ADLs, right, and every day to day living, going to the grocery store, just, just different things. So you want to maintain and to improve the quality of life of their neurological deficits. So if you like this video, please, please, please don't hesitate to subscribe, to like, give it a thumbs up, share this video. Um, don't be shy to comment in the comment sections below. Let me know any feedback is good feedback. And don't forget in the description box, I have extra information that is going to be pre pertained to the subject. So please check it out. And remember, you're just one step closer to finishing your journey in nursing.